Chapter 15 Babiola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vittoria Khan. The Old, Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. Babiola. There was formerly a queen who would have been entirely happy but for an ungratified desire for children she spoke of nothing else and was continually saying that the fairy fanfreluche having attended at her birth and not having been satisfied with the queen her mother had gone into a violent passion with her and had endowed herself the daughter with nothing but misfortunes one day as she was sitting alone by her fireside very much afflicted she saw a little old woman a span high come down the chimney she was riding on a loose bundle of rushes and wearing in her cap a sprig of hawthorn her dress was made of the wings of flies and two walnut shells served her for boots she sailed in the air and after going thrice round the chamber stopped before the queen you have said she to her for a long time murmured against me and have accused me as the author of your misfortunes laying to my charge all that has happened to you you think madam that i am the cause of your having no children now i am come on purpose to announce to you that you will soon have a daughter but i fear that she will cost you many tears Ah noble fanferluche cried the queen do not refuse me your pity and assistance i promise you all the services that lie in my power provided that the princess you announced to me be my comfort and not my affliction destiny is more powerful than i am answered the fairy all that i can do to show you my affection for you is to give you this sprig of white hawthorn secure it to your daughter's head the instant she is born and it will guard her from many dangers she gave her the sprig of white hawthorn and vanished like a flash of lightning the queen remained sad and thoughtful what have i desired said she a daughter who will cost me many tears and sighs should i not be more happy to have none at all the presence of the king whom she dearly loved partly dissipated her grief but she presently took great care to enjoin her most confidential friends to tie on the young princess's head as soon as she should be born the sprig of hawthorn blossom which she kept in a golden box covered with diamonds as the thing that she valued more than anything else in the world at last the queen gave birth to the most beautiful creature that was ever seen they used the utmost diligence in tying the hawthorn flower on her head but no sooner was it done than wonderful to relate in an instant she became a little monkey and began to jump skip and leap about the chamber like an ordinary monkey at this metamorphosis all the ladies uttered dreadful screams and the queen still more alarmed was nearly dying of despair she desired the ladies to remove the sprig of hawthorn from its head after a great deal of difficulty they laid hold of the little creature and removed the fatal flower from her head but vainly she was already a monkey a confirmed monkey and required neither suckling nor nursing all that she wanted was filberts walnuts or chestnuts barbarous fanferluche cried the queen sorrowfully what have i done to be so cruelly treated by you what will become of me what a disgrace will it be to me for all my subjects to think i have given birth unto a monster what detestation the king will have for such a child she burst into tears and begged her ladies to advise her what she should do in so urgent an affair madam said the senior of her attendants the king must be persuaded that the princess is dead and this monkey 
must be shut up in a box and thrown into the sea for it would be a dreadful thing if you were to keep any longer a brute of this kind the queen would hardly consent to this but on being told that the king was coming to her room she was so confused and troubled that without more deliberation she told her maids of honour to do what they liked with the little monkey they then took it into another apartment enclosed it in a box and ordered one of the queen's footmen to throw it into the sea he immediately set out on his errand behold our young princess then exposed to extreme danger the man seeing that the box was a very nice one was sorry to part with it so he seated himself on the seashore and took the little monkey out with the resolution of killing it for he did not know that it was his sovereign's child but while he held it in his arms he heard a loud noise which made him turn his head when he saw an open chariot resplendent with gold and precious stones drawn by six unicorns and preceded by a band of military music on the cushions of the chariot sat a queen bearing her crown and royal mantle and holding on her lap her little son who was four years old the footman recognized in this queen his mistress sister who had been to congratulate her on the birth of a child but learning that the young princess was dead she had very sorrowfully taken her departure on her return to her own kingdom she was in a profound reverie on the miseries of queens when her son cried out i should like how i should like to have that little monkey the queen looking up saw the prettiest little monkey that was ever beheld the footman was for hastily making his retreat but was prevented the queen gave him a large sum of money for the monkey which being gentle and playful she called babiola thus notwithstanding our princess hard fate she fortunately fell into the hands of the queen her aunt when the latter arrived at her court the little prince begged that he might have babiola as a playmate he had dressed her like a princess new clothes were made for her every day and she was taught to walk on her feet it was impossible to find a prettier or more agreeable-looking little monkey her little face was as black as jet with a white frill round her neck and tufts of red hair round her ears her little hands were not larger than the wings of a butterfly and the vivacity of her eyes gave indications of so much talent that there was no occasion for surprise at any of her wonderful actions the prince who was very fond of her won her heart with his unceasing attentions she was very careful not to bite him and whenever she saw him crying she cried too she had already been four years with the queen when she began to stammer like a child trying to speak everybody was mightily surprised at this circumstance but that surprise was changed to utter amazement when she began to talk in a clear and sweet voice and so distinctly that not a word of what she said was lost wonderful cried all the world babiola speaking babiola thinking the queen soon wished to have her again for her own amusement and she was taken to her apartment to the great sorrow of the prince he cried a great deal at her loss and to console him dogs and cats birds squirrels and even a little horse called cricketon which danced the saraband were given to him but he would have preferred babiola to them all fifty times over on her side also the change was not agreeable she was more constrained with the queen than with the prince she was required to answer like a sibyl to a hundred ingenious and learned questions which sometimes she could not easily resolve when a foreign ambassador arrived she was always shown dressed in a velvet or brocade gown with a frill round her neck when the court was in mourning she wore a long black crape mantle which incommoded her very much she was not allowed to eat anything for which she felt inclined a physician always prescribing her food at which she was not at all pleased for she was as wayward as might be expected of a little monkey born a princess the queen appointed her masters who well exercised the vivacity of her mind she excelled in playing on the harpsichord 
a marvelously good one having been made for her in an oyster shell painters came from all the four quarters of the world and especially from italy to take her likeness her renown spread from pole to pole for until that time a monkey with the gift of speech had never been heard of the prince graceful and witty and as handsome as painters represent cupid was a prodigy no less extraordinary he visited babiola and sometimes amused himself in her company their conversations generally witty and lively sometimes took a serious and moral turn babiola had a heart and that heart was not metamorphosed like the rest of her little person she became then very fond of the prince in fact too fond the unfortunate babiola did not know what to do she passed her nights on the top of a window shutter or in the chimney corner and would not go into the basket lined with wadding and feathers very soft and clean which had been prepared for her her governess for she had one often heard her sigh and sometimes complain and weep her melancholy increased as her mind expanded and she never saw herself in a looking-glass without striving out of vexation to break it so that it was commonly said a monkey will always be a monkey babiola with all her talents cannot rid herself of the malicious temper of her species as the prince grew up he became fond of hunting balls plays arms books but with regard to the little monkey he hardly ever mentioned her name things progressed very differently on her side she loved him better at twelve years old than she had loved him at six and sometimes reproached him for his forgetfulness he thought that he quite made up for his neglect by giving her a rosy-cheeked apple or some roasted chestnuts but he very often had her with him when feeling idle and wanting amusement and the young attendants who came to receive his orders could scarcely help laughing at the grave face that babiola turned on them at last the fame of babiola's reputation reached the kingdom of the monkeys itself and king magotin conceived a violent desire to marry her with this view he dispatched a famous embassy to ask her of the queen he had no difficulty in making his prime minister understand his intentions but the latter would have had infinite trouble to express them but for the assistance of the parrots and magpies vulgarly called mags these chattered a great deal and the jackdaws who follow the equipage would have been very sorry to prattle a bit less than they a large ape called mirlifish was the head of the embassy he had a fine carriage built of cards on which were painted the amours of king magotin and the monkey monette famous in the monkeyan empire poor monette died most cruelly under the claw of a wild cat little accustomed to her frolicsome tricks the happiness of magotin and monette during their marriage was represented and the sensible grief in which the king had indulged on her decease six white rabbits of an excellent breed drew this carriage which was called by way of distinction the state carriage it was followed by a chariot constructed of straw painted with various colors and which contained the monkeys destined to attend babiola you should have seen how they were adorned they seemed indeed to be going to a wedding the remainder of the retinue was composed of little spaniels small greyhounds spanish cats muscovy rats a few hedgehogs cunning weasels and dainty foxes some drove the chariots others carried the baggage at the head of the whole went mirlifish graver than a roman dictator wiser than cato and mounted on a young leveret which ambled better than the nicest english nag the queen knew nothing of this magnificent embassy until it arrived at her palace the bursts of laughter from the people and her guards causing her to look out at the window she beheld the most extraordinary cavalcade she had ever seen in her life on its arrival mirlifish followed by a considerable number of apes advanced toward the chariot containing the monkeys and giving his paw to the large monkey called gigonia he assisted her to descend 
then loosing the little parrot which was to serve as his interpreter he awaited that splendid bird's presenting itself to the queen and asking an audience for himself the parrot gently rising in the air went to the window at which the queen was standing and said to her in the prettiest voice in the world madam his excellency count mirlifiche ambassador from the most renowned megaton king of all the monkeys demands an audience of your majesty to treat on business of the utmost importance my pretty parrot said the queen caressing him you had better first take something to eat and a glass of wine after which i consent to your telling count mirlifiche that he is very welcome to my kingdom with all who accompany him if his journey hither from magosha has not too much fatigued him he may immediately enter my audience chamber where i shall await him on my throne with all my court at these words the parrot kissed his foot twice flapped his wings sang a little air in token of his joy and resuming his flight he soon perched on mirlifiche's shoulder and whispered in his ear the favourable answer he had just received mirlifiche was not insensible to the kindness with which he was received and immediately desired margot a magpie who set himself up for a sub-interpreter to ask one of the queen's officers for a room in which he might repose for a short time previous to his expected audience he was immediately shown into an apartment paved with marble painted and gilded and altogether one of the neatest in the palace he had no sooner entered it with part of his suit than as apes are all very inquisitive searchers they ferreted out a certain corner in which divers pots of sweetmeats were arranged behold our gluttons then one with a glass jar of apricots another with a bottle of syrup one with pastry another with a la campagne the chattering gentry who composed part of the cortege were vexed at seeing a repast in which there was neither hemp-seed nor millet-seed and a magpie a mighty great talker flew into the audience chamber and respectfully approaching the queen madam said he to her i am too devoted a servant of your majesty to be a willing accomplice in the havoc which is making in your nice sweetmeats count mirlifiche has already eaten three boxes himself he was busily engaged discussing the fourth without any respect to your majesty when my heart being moved at so shocking an abuse of your majesty's hospitality i left to inform you of the fact i thank you kindly my pretty little magpie said the queen smiling but i dispense with your anxious zeal for my jars of sweetmeats i abandon them in honour of babiola whom i love with all my heart the magpie rather ashamed of the much ado about nothing which he had made retired without saying a word the ambassador followed by his suite shortly after entered the apartment he was not dressed quite in the fashion of the day indeed since the loss of the famous fagotin ambassador from the court of the tuileries to that of king magotin and who had cut such a figure in the monkey world they had no good model his hat was pointed at the top and he wore in it a green feather he wore a blue paper shoulder belt covered with gold spangles large bows of ribbons at his knees and he carried a walking stick immediately on his entering the room the parrot who had the reputation of being a tolerably good poet having composed a very grave harangue advanced to the foot of the throne on which the queen was seated and addressing himself to babiola spoke as follows know the great power o royal dame of those all bright and star-like eyes magotin feels the tender flame and apes and cats a loving train tell in sweet music his young sighs the fair monette his former love with a wild cat in combat strove and when the gentle monkey fell magotin loved his queen so well he vowed eternal truth for then he felt he ne'er could love again but you have made the king forget the fainter charms of queen monette 
sweet long tail once magotin sat enthroned a very king in fat but vacant now is half his throne and naught is left but skin and bone for once believe a poet true he's dying monkey dear for you olives and nuts he used to eat such pleasant fruits his realms abound in he cracked the nuts his favorite meat and threw the shells at all around him these were his freaks alas such sport has ever fled magotin's court unless you deign most noble queen to cure his kingship of the spleen oh half the riches who can tell of the rich realms you'll then reign over figs raisins nuts will please you well you'll be the greatest monkey bell and the first monkey be your lover during this discourse the queen turned her eyes toward babiola who for her part was more disconcerted than she had ever been before in the whole course of her life the queen was anxious to ascertain the sentiments of babiola before she made any answer she however told the parrot to give his excellency the ambassador to understand that she favoured his king's pretensions and would further the marriage in all that depended on her the audience being over she retired and was followed into her closet by babiola my little monkey said the queen to her i must confess that i shall be very sorry to part with you but there would be great danger in denying magotin who asks you in marriage for i have not yet forgotten that his father sent two hundred thousand apes into the field to wage a fierce war against our kingdom and they devoured so many of our subjects that we were obliged to conclude a shameful peace then i am to understand madam replied babiola impatiently that you have resolved to sacrifice me to this vile monster in order to avoid his anger i entreat your majesty however to grant me at least a delay of a few days when i will acquaint you with my final resolution that is but right said the queen but if you take my advice you will determine promptly consider the honours that await you the magnificence of the embassy and the maids of honour who are sent for you i do not know what he may have done for monette replied little babiola disdainfully but i know very well that i am but little moved by the sentiments with which he affects to honour me thereupon she arose and after courtesying gracefully quitted the closet in search of the prince to relate her sorrows to him directly he saw her he called out well babiola when shall we have the pleasure of dancing at your wedding i do not know sir said she sorrowfully but i find myself in so deplorable a condition that it is no longer in my power to withhold my secret from you and although it puts my delicacy to the blush i must confess to you that you are the only person whom i could have wished to have for a husband husband said the prince bursting into a loud laugh husband indeed oh, my little monkey i am charmed at what you tell me i hope however that you will excuse me if i do take advantage of your confession for in truth neither in height looks or manners are we quite suited to each other i agree with you said she and most especially our hearts are not alike you are an ingrate i have long perceived it and i am very foolish to feel an affection for a prince who is so little worthy of it but babiola said he think now were we married what anxiety i should feel to see you at the top of a sycamore tree hanging from a branch by your tail take my advice let us laugh at this affair for the sake of your honour and my own marry king magotin and in token of the good friendship that subsists between us send me your first baby it is fortunate for you sir added babiola that i am not quite a monkey in my mind any other than i would have already scratched out your eyes bitten off your nose and torn off your ears but 
I abandon you to the reflections that you will one day make on your unworthy conduct. She could say no more, for her governess came in to inform her that the ambassador Mirlifish had gone to her apartment with magnificent presents. They consisted of a toilette of spider's web, embroidered with little glow-worms, an eggshell serving to hold the combs, and a white heart cherry for a pincushion, all the linen being ornamented with paper lace. There were besides, in a basket, several shells properly arranged, some serving as drops to earrings, others for bodkins, etc., and all as brilliant as diamonds but better than all these were a dozen boxes of sweetmeats and a little glass box which contained a nut and an olive the key of the box however was lost at which babiola was rather vexed the ambassador informed her in grumbling which is the language made use of in the kingdom of magotia that his monarch was more moved with her charms than he had ever been by those of any other monkey that he was building a palace for her in the topmost branches of a fir tree that he had sent her these presents and particularly the nice sweetmeats to show his attachment but added he the strongest proof of his kindness and the one of which you ought to be most sensible is madam the care he has taken to have his portrait painted that you may anticipate in some measure the pleasure you will feel on seeing himself he thereupon displayed the portrait of the king of the apes seated on a large block of wood eating an apple babiola turned her face on one side so as to look no longer on so disagreeable a figure and grumbling two or three times she gave mirlifish to understand that she was obliged to his master for his esteem but that she had not yet made up her mind whether she would marry or remain single Meantime, the queen had determined not to incur the monkey's anger, and by no means thinking that any great ceremony was requisite in sending Babiola where she intended she should go, she had everything prepared for her departure. On hearing of this, despair took entire possession of Babiola's mind. The prince's contempt, on one hand, the queen's indifference on the other, and still more the idea of such a husband— determined her to make her escape this was not a very difficult thing for since she had been able to speak she had not been tied up she went and came at pleasure and as often entered her room by the window as by the door she made haste therefore to set out and leaping from tree to tree and from branch to branch she reached the bank of a river the excess of her despair prevented her fully comprehending the danger she ran in trying to swim across it so without a moment's consideration she plunged in and immediately sank to the bottom as she did not lose her senses she looked about her and perceived a magnificent grotto adorned all over with shells she entered and was received by a venerable old man whose long white beard reached below his waist he was seated on a couch of reeds and flags he wore on his head a crown of wild poppies, and was reclining against a rock, whence sprang several fountains which augmented the river. "'Ah, what has brought you here, little Babiola?' said he, offering his hand. "'Sir,' answered she, "'I am an unfortunate little monkey, and am flying from a frightful ape whom they wish to make my husband.' "'I know more of your story than you imagine.' answered the wise old man it is true that you abhor magerton but it is no less true that you are in love with a young prince who returns your love with indifference ah sir cried babiola sighing let us not speak of him his remembrance augments my grief he will not always be insensible to love continued the companion of the fishes i know that he is destined for the fairest princess in the world unfortunate that i am said babiola then he will never be mine the good man smiled and said to her do not afflict yourself my good babiola time is a powerful master only be careful not to lose the little glass box that king magerton sent you 
and as you have got it by good luck in your pocket i need say no more about it to you here is a crocodile who travels very steadily seat yourself on its back and it will conduct you where you ought to go after the obligations that you have imposed on me said she to him i cannot depart without knowing your name i am called biroqua said he father of the river by that name which is as you may perceive rather large and famous babiola then seated herself on the crocodile's back very confidently and they travelled for some time on the water after passing rather a long winding the crocodile reached the bank it would have been difficult to find anything more tasteful than its english saddle and the rest of its harness there were even little pistols in the saddle-bow the holsters for which were made of the shells of crabs babiola was proceeding on her journey with entire confidence in the sage biroqua's promises when she suddenly heard a loud noise alas alas it was the ambassador mirlifish and his retinue who were returning to magosha sorrowful and desolate at babiola's flight an ape of this troop had mounted a walnut tree and was knocking down walnuts for the amusement of the retinue when just as he had reached the highest branches he perceived babiola seated on a crocodile which was slowly travelling up the open country at this sight he uttered such a loud shout that the assembled apes asked him anxiously in their language what was the matter no sooner had he told them than the parrots magpies and jackdaws were immediately let loose and flew to where she was and on their report the ambassador the monkeys and the remainder of the equipage hastened to arrest her what a misfortune for babiola a greater or more terrible it would have been difficult to bring upon her she was obliged to get into the state carriage which was thereupon surrounded by vigilant monkeys some foxes and a cock who perched on the roof and kept watch day and night an ape leading the crocodile as a very rare animal brought up the rear of the cavalcade which continued its journey to the great grief of babiola whose only companion was madame gigonia a peevish ill-tempered monkey at the end of three days which passed without any adventure the guides lost their way and they all arrived at a large town of which they did not know the name but seeing a fine garden the door of which was open they halted therein and fell upon everything it contained as though they had been in a conquered country one cracked walnuts another gobbled cherries while a third robbed a plum-tree in a word there was not a little monkey brat among them who did not both eat and lay in a good store you must know that this town was the capital of the kingdom in which babiola had been born that the queen her mother resided there and that since the misfortune she had experienced in seeing her daughter metamorphosed into a monkey by the sprig of hawthorn she would not allow either monkey marmoset or baboon to remain in the kingdom or anything which might recall the fatal and deplorable adventure to her remembrance an ape was then looked upon as a disturber of the public peace judge then of the universal astonishment of the people at seeing a carriage of card arrive with a chariot of painted straw and the rest of this most surprising monkey equipage perhaps the most extraordinary that was ever seen since tales were tales and fairies were fairies the news flew like lightning to the palace and the queen was astounded fearing that the long-tailed gentry were about to attack her authority she promptly assembled her council issued a proclamation condemning them all as guilty of high treason and not wishing to lose an opportunity of making so famous an example for the future she sent her guards into the garden with orders to seize upon all the monkeys they threw large nets over the trees and soon brought their chase to a conclusion and notwithstanding the high respect due to the quality of ambassador that character suffered so much in the person of mirlifish that he was unmercifully thrown to the bottom of a cave and put under a large empty tub where he and his comrades were imprisoned with the lady monkeys who had accompanied babiola for her part she felt a secret joy at this turn in her affairs 
when misfortunes reach a certain point they cease to afflict and even death is met without a murmur this was precisely her situation her heart being occupied by the image of a prince who despised her and her mind filled with the frightful idea of king magotin whose wife she was about to become for the rest i must not forget to state that her clothes were so pretty and her manners so uncommon that those who had taken her stayed to regard her as something marvellous and when she spoke to them their astonishment was not a little augmented although they had already heard of the admirable babiola the queen who had found her being unacquainted with her niece's metamorphosis had frequently written to her sister that she had a very wonderful little monkey and had requested her to come and see it but the afflicted queen had always hastily passed over that part of the letter without reading it the guards transported with admiration carried babiola to a large gallery and having erected a little throne she ascended it more like a sovereign than a captive monkey and the queen accidentally passing was so forcibly struck with her pretty appearance and the gracious compliments she paid her that in spite of herself nature spoke in the child's favour she took her up in her arms the little creature animated on her side with feelings that she had never before experienced threw herself on the queen's neck and said such tender and engaging things that she struck everybody who heard her with admiration no oh, great queen cried she it is not the fear of approaching death with which i learn you have threatened the unfortunate race of monkeys that terrifies me or induces me to take the means of pleasing and softening you the close of my life is not the greatest misfortune that could befall me and i possess feelings so much above my condition that i should regret even the least step taken to preserve that life no madam it is for yourself alone that i love you your crown moves me much less toward you than your merit what answer could the queen make to so courteous and complimentary a speech more dumb than a carp she stared with surprise thinking that she was in a dream and feeling her heart very much affected she carried the monkey to her closet when they were alone she said to her do not delay a moment the relation of your adventures to me for i feel that of all the animals which people my menageries and which i keep in my palace you will be the one that i shall love the most i assure you that on your account i will even pardon the apes who accompany you ah madam cried babiola i ask you nothing for them my misfortune was to be born a monkey and the same misfortune has gifted me with a discernment which will make me suffer until my death for in a word what do i not feel when i see myself in a looking-glass little ugly and black having paws covered with hair with a long tail and teeth always ready to bite being conscious at the same time that i have taste delicacy and feelings and do not want intelligence are you capable said the queen of feeling an attachment babiola sighed but made no answer oh continued the queen you must tell me whether you love an ape a rabbit or a squirrel for if you are disengaged i have a dwarf who will be an excellent match for you at this proposition babiola put on a disdainful air at which the queen laughed heartily do not afflict yourself said she to her and inform me by what miracle you speak all that i know of my adventures replied babiola is that the queen your sister had no sooner quitted you after the birth and death of the princess your daughter than she saw as she was passing the seashore one of your valets who was on the point of drowning me i was forcibly taken from him by her order and by the most unheard of prodigy in the world speech and reason came to me many masters were appointed to teach me various languages and to play on musical instruments at last madam i became sensible of my misfortunes and but what ails you madam cried she seeing the queen's countenance pale and covered with a cold perspiration whence this extraordinary change which i remark in your person i am dying 
said the queen in a feeble and inarticulate voice i am dying my dear and too unfortunate daughter to-day then i have at last recovered you at these words she fainted away the terrified babiola ran for assistance the queen's ladies hastened to give her water to unlace her stays and to put her in bed and babiola crept into bed with her without observation being extremely small when the queen returned to herself after the long swoon into which the princess discourse had thrown her she desired to be left alone with the ladies who were acquainted with the secret of her daughter's fatal birth and informed them of what had befallen her at which they were so dismayed that they knew not how to advise her she commanded them however to tell her what they thought she had better do in so grievous a juncture some advised her to have the monkey stifled others to shut her up in a hole and a third party to have her sent back again to the sea the queen cried and sobbed she is so clever said she what a pity to see her reduced to this miserable condition by an enchanted sprig of hawthorn but continued she she is my daughter and my blood it is i who have drawn upon her the wicked fanferluche's wrath and is it just that she should suffer for the hatred that that fairy bears to me but madam cried her old lady of honour we must save your reputation what would the world think if you were to declare that a monkey were your child it is unnatural for so beautiful a person as you to have such children the queen lost all patience at hearing her argue in this way but soon consented with no less warmth that it was necessary to exterminate the little monster at last however her majesty resolved to shut up babiola in a castle where she would be well nursed and kindly treated during the remainder of her life when babiola heard that the queen intended to put her in prison she quietly slipped out of the bed and jumping from the window on to a tree in the garden she made her escape into a large forest and left everybody in alarm at not finding her she passed the night in the hollow of an oak tree in which she had time to reflect on the cruelty of her fate but what most pained her was the necessity she was under of quitting the queen however she preferred being her own mistress in voluntary exile to losing her liberty for ever on the appearance of daylight she continued her journey without knowing whither she was to go and considering and reconsidering a thousand times the singularity of so extraordinary an adventure what a difference cried she between what i am and what i ought to be tears fell in abundance from the little eyes of poor babiola she however journeyed on sometimes fearful that the queen might pursue her and sometimes alarmed lest some of the monkeys who had escaped from the cave might seize on and take her against her will to the king magotin but still proceeding without following either road or footpath she at last arrived at a large desert in which there was neither house nor tree fruit grass nor spring she entered on it without reflection and it was not until she began to feel hungry that she discovered too late the extent of her imprudence in attempting to travel through such a country two days and two nights she passed without being able to catch even a gnat or a little worm and fear of death seized her she became so weak that she swooned and fell on the earth when remembering the olive and the nut that were still in the little glass box she thought that she might make a light repast of them joyful at this ray of hope she picked up a stone broke the box in pieces and began to eat the olive hardly had she put her teeth therein when an abundance of perfumed oil flowed from it which falling on her paws they immediately became the most delicate hands in the world her surprise as may be imagined was extreme she instantly took some of this oil and rubbed herself all over with it when marvellous to relate she made herself so beautiful that nothing in the world could equal her charms she felt that she had large eyes a small mouth 
and a handsome nose. She was dying for want of a looking-glass. At last she bethought herself of making one of the largest piece of glass of her broken box. Oh, what joy! Oh, what delight! When she saw her own loveliness, her clothes had changed with herself, her hair fell in a thousand flowing ringlets, and her complexion was as fresh as the flowers in spring. The first moments of her surprise being passed, her hunger became still more violent, and her sorrow augmented proportionately. What, said she, so beautiful and so young, born princess as I am, must I perish in this desolate spot? Oh, cruel fortune, that hast conducted me here, to what hast thou destined me? Is it to add to afflictions alone that thou hast wrought so happy and so unhoped for a change in my person? And thou, O venerable Biroqua, who didst so generously save my life, wilt thou too leave me to perish in this frightful solitude? In vain did the poor princess invoke assistance in this solitary desert. Not even Echo answered to her voice. The want of food tormented her to such a degree that she at last took the nut and cracked it, when, as she threw the shell from her, she was amazed to see issue therefrom architects, painters, masons, upholsterers, sculptors, and all kinds of different workmen. They immediately commenced operations. Some designed a palace, others built it, and others furnished it. One party painted the rooms, another cultivated the gardens, all was resplendent with gold and azure. No sooner was this done than a sumptuous repast was served, and sixty princesses, more handsomely dressed than queens, led by squires, and followed by pages, came and paid Babiola the highest compliments, inviting her to the feast that was awaiting her. It may be supposed that she did not require much persuasion. She immediately advanced toward the saloon, and there, seating herself at the table with a queenly air, she ate like one famished. No sooner had she risen from table than her treasurers brought into her presence fifteen thousand large coffers, as large as hogsheads, full of gold and diamonds. They asked her if she would allow them to pay the workmen who built her palace. She said that that was but right, but made it a condition that they should also build near it a town, marry, and settle therein. To this they all consented, and the town was finished in three-quarters of an hour, although it was fifty times larger than Rome. Behold the numerous prodigies which issued from a little nut." The princess resolved to send a splendid embassy to the queen her mother, and to take this opportunity of deservedly reproaching the young prince her cousin for his former treatment of her. While taking the necessary measures for this purpose, she amused herself by witnessing ring-races, she always giving the prize. She also went to the theatre, hunted and fished, for a river had also been conducted thither, the fame of her beauty soon spread itself over all the earth, and kings from its four quarters came to pay her court, and also giants taller than mountains, and figures smaller than rats. It happened one day during a grand festival and tournament that as several knights were breaking lances a quarrel arose, and, disregardful of her presence, they fought in earnest. The princess, in anger, descended from her balcony to ascertain and punish the originators of the strife, and to assist the wounded when, as the visor of one of these was raised, what were her feelings at seeing the prince her cousin? Though not quite dead, he was so severely injured that she was herself nearly dying with surprise and grief. She had him instantly borne to the finest apartment in the palace, where nothing requisite to effect his cure was wanting the best medicine, eminent surgeons, nice broth and syrups, all were there. Babiola herself made the bandages and lint, watering them with her tears, tears which might have served as a balsam for her wounded cousin. Wounded indeed he was, in more than one sense of the word, for without reckoning half a dozen sword and as many lance wounds which had pierced him through and through, he had been at that court for some time incognito, 
and had felt the power of babiola's eyes to an incurable extent it is then easy to judge what were his feelings when he read in that amiable princess countenance that she was in the utmost grief at witnessing the condition to which he was reduced i will not stop to repeat to you the terms in which his heart prompted him to thank her for the kindness she had manifested toward him those who heard him were surprised that so sick a man should be able to show so much passion and gratitude the princess babiola who blushed more than once at it begged him to be silent but his emotion and the ardour of his protestations were so extreme that she saw him suddenly sink in dreadful anguish until then she had borne all with firmness but on seeing him in so terrible a condition she uttered loud cries tore her hair and gave everybody reason to think that her heart must be of easy access since in so short a time it could feel so great a passion for a stranger for it was not known in babiola's kingdom that the prince was her cousin and that she had loved him from her earliest youth it appears that while travelling the prince was attracted by babiola's reputation to her court and being unacquainted with any one there who could introduce him to the princess he thought that nothing could so well serve his turn as the performance in her presence of five or six heroic feats such as cutting off the legs arms or heads of a few knights in a tournament he found however no one complacent enough to allow him so to do a rude scuffle then ensued the strongest party as usual beat the weaker and to that weaker party unfortunately belonged as i have already stated our prince babiola in despair ran along the highway without either carriage or guards she entered a wood and fainted away at the foot of a tree whence the fairy fanferluche who never slept but was always seeking opportunities for evil actions carried her on a cloud blacker than ink and which sailed along more swiftly than the wind the princess remained for some time insensible when she recovered nothing could equal her surprise at finding herself so far from the earth and so near to the pole the footing on clouds is not very solid so that as she ran to and fro she seemed to be treading on feathers and the cloud separating at times she had much difficulty to prevent herself from falling she found no one with whom to share her grief for the wicked fanferluche had rendered herself invisible she had time to think of her dear prince and the condition in which she had left him and gave way to the most mournful thoughts that can take possession of the mind what cried she am i capable of surviving him i love and of allowing the fear of approaching death to find a place in my heart ah if the sun would scorch me to death with his beams what a good office would he render me if i could drown myself in the rainbow how happy i should be but alas all the zodiac is deaf to my voice sagittarius for me has no arrows for me the bull no horns and the lion no teeth perhaps the earth will be more obliging and will offer to me at least the point of a rock on which i may slay myself o oh, prince dear dear cousin why art thou not here to witness for thy sake the most tragical leap on which desperate lover ever resolved as she finished these words she ran to the end of the cloud and precipitated herself from it like an arrow shot from an english bow all who saw her thought that the moon was falling and as cynthia was just then on the wane several people who adored her and who remained some time without seeing her again put on deep mourning for her loss persuading themselves that the sun in a fit of jealousy had done the moon this evil turn however great the princess wished for death die she did not she fell into a glass bottle in which the fairies generally keep their ratafia in the sun but what a bottle there is not a tower in the world so large fortunately it was empty or she must have been drowned therein like a fly the six giants who guarded it immediately recognized babiola they were the same who had resided in her court and who loved her as did all the world but the malignant fanferluche she who did nothing by chance had transported each of these giants hither on a flying dragon and the six dragons guarded the bottle while the giants slept 
while babiola was there she frequently regretted her monkey skin she lived like the chameleon on air and dew the prison in which she was thus confined was unknown to any one of course therefore the young prince her cousin was ignorant of it for he was not dead but unceasingly asked for babiola he easily perceived from the melancholy looks of all who attended on him that there was some subject of general grief at court his natural discretion prevented him seeking to learn what it might be but when convalescent he pressed so earnestly that he was apprised of the prince's loss for they had not the courage to conceal it longer from him those who had seen her enter the wood maintained that she had been devoured by lions a second party thought she had destroyed herself in despair and others opined that she had lost her wits and was wandering over the world as this latter opinion was the least terrible and as it gave the prince a slight ground for hope he seized upon it and set out on his horse cricketon of whom i have already spoken but of whom i forgot to say that he was descended from bucephalus and one of the best horses of the age in which he flourished the prince was attended by two of his most faithful followers putting the bridle on his horse's neck the prince allowed him to choose his own road sometimes he called upon the princess but in vain echo alone replied at last he arrived at the bank of a large river cricketon was thirsty and went into it to drink and the prince continuing to shout at the top of his lungs babiola beautiful babiola where are you he heard a voice whose sweetness seemed to charm the waves advance it replied and you shall learn where she is at these words the prince as daring as he was affectionate gave cricketon two or three thrusts with his spurs which made him swim onward until he came to a gulf in which the water precipitated itself more rapidly when the prince sank with his horse to the bottom thoroughly persuaded that he was on the point of being drowned he luckily however had arrived at the residence of the good man Biroqua, who was then celebrating the wedding of his daughter with one of the richest and deepest rivers in the country all the aquatic deities were in his grotto where the tritons and the sirens were making a charming melody and the river Biroqua, lightly dressed was dancing gaily with the thames the seine the euphrates and the ganges who had certainly come a long distance to amuse themselves together cricketon who was very polite stayed very respectfully at the entrance of the grotto and the prince still more polite than his horse made a low bow and asked if it were permitted for a mortal like him to make his appearance in the midst of so distinguished an assembly biroqua spoke with an affable air and replied that they would feel both honoured and gratified by his presence i have been waiting for you some days continued he i am in your interests sir and those of the princess are likewise dear to me you must rescue her from the fatal place in which the vindictive hanferluche has imprisoned her she is in a bottle ah what do you tell me cried the prince interrupting him my princess in a bottle yes answered the wise old man and she is greatly distressed but i warn you sir that it is by no means an easy task to conquer the giants and dragons who guard her at least if you do not follow my advice you must leave your good horse here and mount a winged dolphin which i have been training for you a long time he then had the dolphin brought saddled and bridled and it pranced and curveted so well that cricketon was quite jealous of him biroqua and his companions immediately set about arming the prince they equipped him in a brilliant cuirass of gilded carp scales his headpiece consisted of a large periwinkle shell shaded by a large cod's tail which hung in the form of a handsome plume of heron's feathers a naiad girded him with an eel from which hung a formidable sword made of the backbone of a large fish and he was then presented with a magnificent tortoise shell as a shield thus equipped not the smallest gudgeon who saw him but conceived that he beheld the god of souls 
and verily the young prince had a certain air that is rarely met with among mortals hope springs eternal in the human breast and that of soon finding the charming princess with whom he was in love inspired our prince with a joy that he had been incapable of feeling since her loss the chronicle whence this authentic tale is extracted relates that he ate with a very good appetite at baroque's table and that he thanked all the company for their kindness in no common terms after which he rose from table bade adieu to cricketon then mounting the winged fish he immediately set out at the close of the day the prince found himself already so high that he entered for the sake of a little rest into the kingdom of the moon the rarities that he observed there and which have been so well described by later travellers would have arrested his serious attention if he had not had a more pressing object in view to wit that of liberating babiola from the bottle in which she had then been residing several months day no sooner broke than away he rode on his dolphin again and long ere noon he had discovered the princess surrounded by the giants and dragons that the fairy by virtue of her little wand had retained near her and so little idea had fanferluche that any one was powerful enough to free babiola from captivity that she confidently reposed on the vigilance of her terrible guards with the certainty of its prolongation the lovely babiola was pitifully looking toward heaven and addressing there her sorrowful lamentations when she saw the flying dolphin and the prince who was coming to her deliverance she could hardly believe her eyes when she saw an armed knight near her bottle although she knew from her own experience that to some persons the most extraordinary things are of easy accomplishment may it not be through the malice of some wicked fairies said she that this knight is thus transported through the air alas how much i pity him if a bottle or carafe is destined for his prison as it serves for mine while these reflections occupied her mind the giants who perceived the prince over their head and took him for a kite which some little boy in the moon was flying cried out to each other lay hold of this string lay hold of this string it will serve to divert us but while under this impression they stooped to pick him up he fell on them cut and thrust and knocked them into as many pieces as a pack of cards cut and thrown to the wind on hearing the first noise of this encounter the princess turned her head and recognized her own dear prince oh what joy to be certain that he was as yet alive but oh what anxiety to see him exposed to such perils fighting in the midst of the terrible giants and dragons which were then attacking him she uttered fearful cries and his danger nearly cost her her life however the enchanted fishbone sword with which biroqua had armed the prince struck no useless blows and the nimble dolphin rising and stooping just at the proper times was a marvellous help to the prince so that in a short time the field was covered with these monsters the impatient prince who saw his princess through the glass would have broken it in pieces if he had not been fearful of wounding her so he determined on descending through the neck of the bottle when he reached the bottom he threw himself at babiola's feet and respectfully kissed her hand sir said she to him it is well in order that you may restrain your emotions that i inform you of the motives which have interested me so tenderly in your preservation learn then that we are nearly related that i am the daughter of the queen your aunt and that same babiola whom you found in the form of a little monkey on the seashore who was weak enough to express for you an attachment and whom you despised ah madam cried the prince can i believe so unheard of a prodigy what you have been a monkey you have loved me and i have known your love in my heart has been capable of refusing the greatest of earthly blessings well replied the princess smiling at his surprise i should now perhaps have but a very poor opinion of your taste had you then conceived any attachment for me but let us depart i am tired of my prison and i fear my enemy 
let us go to the queen my mother and inform her of all these extraordinary events which cannot fail to interest her with all my heart madam said the amorous prince and getting on the winged dolphin's back and taking her in his arms let us go said he and restore to her in you the most amiable princess in the world the dolphin gently rose in the air winging his course toward the capital in which the queen was spending her sorrowful existence the flight of babiola did not leave her a moment's repose she could not help thinking of her favorite and thus continually calling to her remembrance the pretty things that babiola had said to her monkey as she was the queen would have given half her kingdom for another sight of her when the prince arrived he disguised himself as an old man and demanded a private audience of the queen madam said he i have studied from my most tender youth the necromantic art you may judge of my skill by the fact that i am not ignorant of the hatred that fanferluche bears toward you or of its disastrous effects but dry your tears madam for that same babiola whom you have seen so ugly is now about to be restored to you the most beautiful princess in the world provided however that you will pardon the queen your sister for the cruel war that she has waged against you and conclude the peace by marrying the princess babiola with the prince your nephew i cannot flatter myself that what you affirm is true replied the queen weeping wise old man you wish to soothe my affliction i have lost my dear daughter i have no longer a husband my sister pretends that my kingdom belongs to her her son is as unjust as his mother they both persecute me and i will enter into no alliance with them fate wills it otherwise continued he and i am commissioned to tell you so ah but of what use would it be added the queen to consent to this marriage the wicked fanferluche has too much power and is too malicious not to oppose it always do not alarm yourself on that score madam replied the good man promise me only that you will not oppose the marriage in question i promise everything cried the queen provided i see my dear daughter once again the prince went out and ran to where the princess was awaiting him she was surprised to see him disguised which made it necessary for him to relate to her that for some time past the two queens had had violent altercations and that there had been much animosity between them but that at last he had made his aunt consent to his wishes the princess was in ecstasies she went to the palace and all who met her observed so perfect a resemblance in her to the queen her mother that curiosity induced them to follow her to learn who she was when the queen perceived her her heart was so violently agitated that it required no other testimony to prove the truth of what had been told her the princess threw herself at her mother's feet and was received by the queen with open arms after a silence of some moments drying each other's tears with a thousand kisses they gave vent to their feelings in all those tender expressions which may be easily imagined on such an occasion then turning to her nephew the queen received him very favorably and reiterated to him all the promises she had made to the necromancer she would have said more but a noise in the courtyard drawing her attention to the window she had the agreeable surprise of seeing the queen her sister arrive the prince and princess looking also recognized near her the venerable biroqua and even the good cricketon who was also of the party they one and all gave utterance to loud cries of joy they hastened to embrace each other with inexpressible transport the nuptials of the prince and the fair babiola were celebrated immediately in spite of the wicked fanferluche whose power and malice were thus equally confounded End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen the three bears this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Emily Lost. The Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. The Three Bears. A certain German forest near the Hartz Mountains, there lived three exceedingly domestic bears. There was the father bear, the mother bear, and a little son. They had a nice little house, a chair each to sit on, a bed to sleep in, and a basin each for milk and honey, which was their favorite food. The fathers were the largest, the mothers a little smaller, and the little bears were the smallest of all. One day, they boiled their milk and honey for breakfast, poured it into their basins, and went out for a walk while it cooled. Now it happened that very near the bear's little dwelling lived a woodman's little daughter all by herself. She was called Golden Hair. Her father and mother were both dead, so she was quite alone. She kept her small house very neat, made herself a bed of moss and beech leaves, and used to pick berries for her food. Of course the poor little thing had no one to teach her right from wrong, and she lived quite like a little savage in her forest home. Only she was a gentle creature and used to sing like the birds in the trees under which she played. On the very morning that the three bears went for a walk, Golden Hair was also rambling about the wood. By and by she came to the bear's house and as the window was open, she peeped in. Seeing no one there, she shifted the latch and walked into the house. This was very rude of Golden Hair, but then she knew no better. She saw the three basins and looked into them, and then, taking up the tiny bears, she tasted his milk and honey. She thought it very nice indeed, so she sat down in the little bear's chair to eat it, but the chair was much too small for her, and she broke the seat and fell through, basin and all. Now this was certainly stealing, but Golden Hair did not know that she ought not to take what was not her own. A tiny bear may only be a tiny bear, but still he has a right to his own things. Then Golden Hair went upstairs, and there she saw the three little bears all in a row. The first was the father bears, the second was the mother bears, and the last was tiny bears. Golden Hair thought they looked very comfortable, and as she was a little tired, she got into the tiny bears and fell asleep. By and by, the bears came home. Tiny Bear looked at his chair and basin and said, Somebody's been here. And Father Bear gruffly said, Somebody has been here. And Mother Bear said, not quite so gruffly, Somebody has been here. And then they went to the table and looked at their basins. And the Father Bear said gruffly, Somebody has touched my basin. And Mother Bear said less gruffly, Somebody has touched my basin. And Tiny Bear said in a high, shrill voice, and somebody has broken mine. Then they all went upstairs and looked into their beds. There is no one in my bed, said Father Bear gruffly. There is nobody in my bed, said Mother Bear less gruffly. There is a little girl in my bed, squeaked Tiny Bear. And she has eaten up my breakfast and broken my chair and cracked my basin. The shrill voice of Tiny Bear woke up Golden Hair and she startled out of the bed. The window was open, and she was so frightened that she jumped right out of it at once and ran away. And the bears went to the window and watched her, and saw her disappear into the forest. The father bear said gruffly, The wolves will eat her. And mother bear said less gruffly, The wolves will eat her. And tiny bear squeaked in his shrill voice, The wolves will eat her. But they did not. Now, if you wish very much to know what became of Golden Hair, I will tell you. She ran terrified through the woods. She fell over the trunk of a tree, and while she lay on the ground, weeping, a bee buzzed up to her and said, Little golden hair, what has happened? I went into the bear's house, beautiful bee, and ate up some milk and honey. And then I got into tiny bear's bed and fell asleep, and the bears came home and found me. And I was so frightened that I jumped out of the window and I had just fallen down. If I had not jumped out, I dare say, they would have killed me. Very likely, buzzed the bee. I dislike bears very much myself, and never cross their threshold. They eat our honey, they have no manners, and their figures are so very awkward, and their movements so uncouth. But you had no right to eat tiny bears' breakfast. That was stealing, and it was wrong. Never take a drop of honey from a flower without asking its leave first. Golden Hair sobbed out that she did not know that it was wrong. Well, said the bee, I don't see how you should, as you have not been taught. We bees have often pitied you. Now I am not rich. I am only an upholster bee. And I don't live in a hive. And I have no queen. But if you like to live with me and my little girl, I will do all that I can for you. Golden Hair was very glad to accept his kind offer. 
for she thought that honey was very nice, and she had no doubt that it would be her food if she lived with the upholster bee. Then the bee showed the child where she lived, in a hollow tree, and Golden Hair thought it was a very fine dwelling, for a bee had hung it all around with curtains cut from red poppy leaves, and it was so clean that you could have been delighted with it. Now, Golden Hair, said the bee, we cannot endure dirty children. Go and wash yourself in the stream, and wash your frock, and hang it out to dry. Golden Hair did what she was told, and when she was nicely dressed again in a clean white frock, and all her golden hair lay on her shoulders glistening in the sun, she looked very pretty indeed. She played all day with the butterflies and birds, and when the sun set, she fell asleep. The next day, the bee buzzed in her ear as soon as it was light, and woke her up. Golden hair, she said, as the child sat up and rubbed her sleepy blue eyes. We can't have idle people here. I hate a drone. Get up and work. I have nothing to do, said golden hair. I can't make honey. But you can do a great many other things. Only wish I had your wonderful hands said the bee. What can I do? asked Golden Hair. I'll tell you. Get up and take a wooden spade and dig up the sweetest flowers in the wood and plant them here close to my cell and when no rain comes, water them and don't let the greedy worms eat them all up and pick them off the leaves. Golden Hair did as she was told, but not for very long, for a silly butterfly came and coaxed her to run a race with him and laughed at her for grubbing in the mud and making her hands dirty. So she ran races and did not work. By and by she was hungry, and she said to the butterfly, Will you give me some honey for dinner? I have not any honey, answered he. You cannot expect a gentleman like me to provide food. It is quite beneath me. I eat a little bit of leaf here and there. Oh my, I am so hungry, sobbed Golden Hair. Absurd, how vulgar you are, sang the butterfly, and he flew away. For, as he told the nearest rose, he hated to see tears, and the rose smiled at his wit and admired his fine feelings. Golden Hair went home and found her dinner ready, the purest honey, scented with lilac and wild thyme, and honeysickle. She ate a great deal of it and thanked the bee. And the bee said, You have not done much work. If I had been as idle as you are, I should have no dinner to give you. It was all the butterfly's fault, said Golden Hair. Nonsense said the bee. He could not make you idle unless you chose to be so. Don't tell me. One would get very little done if one could be persuaded to play at every idle insect you once saw. I will do better tomorrow, said Golden Hair. Better begin today, answered the bee. Who can tell if the sun will shine tomorrow? So Golden Hair worked all afternoon, and when night came she felt happy and satisfied, as everybody does when they have done right. And a kind nightingale, who had been pleased to see her so industrious, came and sat on a bow close by and sang her to sleep. The next day, a robin woke her. Get up, he said. Golden hair, the lark is singing hymns, and it's a pity you should not join in them. Besides, if you don't get up early, you will find no worms. Thank you, said golden hair. But I don't eat worms. I breakfast on honey. That is very well for dessert, said robin. But for food, I prefer something more substantial. <sighs> I should like a few cherries, sighed Golden Hair. There are plenty of strawberries in the wood, said Robin. If you will come with me, I will show you where they grow. And he showed Golden Hair a bit of ripe strawberries growing on a sunny bank, and they were quite delicious. What a clever bird you are, said the child as she ate her breakfast with the Robin. And yet, I should not have thought so, judging by your very plain suit, though... To be sure, your breast is a pretty colour. We must not judge by outside show, said Robin. Neither I nor the bee are as gay as the butterfly, but I think I may say without boasting that we are worth a dozen of him. And Golden Hair thought so too. By and by the winter came and snow fell fast and the bitter wind blew through the trees. Golden Hair crouched down inside the old tree on the moss and wept with the cold. What a pity it is you have no feathers, said the Robin. Go to sleep said the bee drowsily. This is the sort of weather for a good nap. But Golden Hair could not sleep for the cold and wishing would not give her feathers. By and by, the robin said to bee, Golden Hair ought to go home to her own kind. I've had some crumbs today from such good people. I'm sure if they knew the child was here, they would help. But how can we let them know? said the bee. You see, 
their education is so bad that they know nothing of our languages i will tell the dog said robin he is a great philanthropist and can settle ways and means i ought to think he is much wiser than his master a pheasant told me last autumn that the gentleman can do nothing without him do speak to the dog said the bee i don't like to see golden hair suffer and do nothing for her so the robin told the dog and the dog said show me where the child is and robin did so and the dog barked and fawned on the little child and golden hair was pleased and stroked him and nestled up to him and warmed herself and the dog lay closer beside her and warmed her with his breath and by and by he took some meat from his master's plate and brought it to the hungry child and the dog's master said to his wife i wonder where trey goes every day with a piece of meat and his wife said why do you not follow him so the next day the gentleman went after his dog and followed him through the wood till he came to a hollow tree and there inside it very pale and cold and miserable lay a little child with golden hair and the dog gave her the meat while a solitary bee buzzing faintly near and a robin twittered gratefully from a twig the dog's master went in and took the poor babe in his arms and spoke to her but golden hair had quite forgotten her own language and knew only the dialects of the wood but she wept and clasped the gentleman's arm with beseeching hands poor besotted babe he said embracing her i will take you home and you shall be to me as a daughter and the bee buzzed her contentment and the robin sang a lay of rejoice and the dog barked and frisked as if he were wild with delight so golden hair was taken home by the dog's kind master and he gave her to his wife and said i have found a wild child in the forest let her be our own and the lady clasped the babe in her arms and loved her from that day and christened her mary and thus it happened that no one ever knew what had become of golden hair end of chapter sixteen